once heard a story of a tennis pro whose game had gone into a slump. He tried everything he could imagine to get his game back. Fired his trainer, got another trainer, tried all kinds of things. And then finally one day re realized he had forgotten the number one lesson in tennis, keep your eye on the ball. The same thing happens often in meditation. You start out with a very simple process and then you try to make it more complicated. And many times you forget the first principles, i.e. stay with your breath. So try to spend the whole hour staying with the breath, no matter what. And be really sensitive to how the breath feels and what you're doing to the breath. The breath is a fabrication i.e. there's an intentional element in the way you breathe. And you want to be very sensitive to that. What are you adding to the breathing process? And you find it's something very intimate, very private. Often it's hard to talk about how the breath feels, because the breath feels like the breath feels. It doesn't quite feel like anything else. So we can talk about it indirectly, we can talk about it in terms of metaphors and similes, realizing that our descriptions are approximate. So when you hear something in the instructions, see how you relate to it, exactly what this refers to in your experience. And keep your inner experience primary. For example, I've noticed that one of the best ways of getting the breath energy in the body to be comfortable and full is not to put any effort into the out-breath at all. What effort there may be goes into the in-breath. As for breathing out, you don't need to help the body. It's going to breathe out on its own. And when you don't force it out, that allows the breath to fill up in the body i.e. the breath energy. It's not like you're trying to stuff the breath in, but as you don't squeeze it out, each time you breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, and allow the sense of fullness to run along your nerves. The nerves begin to have a sense of, of almost glowing. Not a visible glow, but there's a feeling of radiation, or radiance coming out of the, the nerves, out of the blood vessels. And you try to breathe in such a way that maintains that sense of radiance. And you find that the body feels a lot more comfortable. The blood can flow freely through all the different parts of the body. It feels really good. So try to relate that to what you're doing right now and see if you get results. And if you don't, try experimenting a little bit on your own to see what way of breathing really does feel good in the body. Because what this does, it sets up the issue of pleasure and pain right from the start. That's what the Buddha's teachings are all about. Why do we suffer from pain? How can we use the pleasure of a concentrated mind to lead us to even greater ease and well-being? And often it's best not to analyze it too much in advance. You can read about the books on jhana or in vipassana. And then again, you try to take the words and impose them on your experience. And of course, your understanding of the words comes from where? It comes from ignorance. So that gets you away from your direct experience, away from this very private matter of why the mind is causing itself suffering. How are your intentions causing suffering? So 
So instead, try to approach the meditation from something that's more familiar. How do you feel right now? In what ways of thinking about the breath, what ways of letting the body breathe lead to pain and a sense of constriction? Which ones lead to a greater sense of openness and ease in the body? Start from your immediate experience and move on from there. Move on from there. That's the way John Fuang used to teach meditation. Have people get in touch with their breath. He'd use a few analogies and a few similes. And then he'd listen to how they described the experience of meditation. When the breath felt, as he said, sticky, when it felt solid, when it felt full. One of his students would talk about the delicious breath. And then he would use their vocabulary to teach them further. This way the meditation is not something imposed from outside, it's something that develops from your own inner sensitivity. And somewhat after the fact, after you've had some direct experience with it, then you can read the books and begin to relate their terms to what you've experienced. Although even then it's always best to take those terms and use it as post-it notes. Because you may find as you develop your inner experience further, your understanding of the inner terrain is going to change, and you have to move some of those notes around. But this is a much more trustworthy way of approaching the meditation than trying to fit the mind into a mold based on your understanding of what somebody else has said. Because it takes you away from your direct experience, takes you away from your own sensitivity. And there's always that element of doubt. Does this really qualify as what they're talking about? Or is your approach it from the other direction? If I do it this way, how does it feel? You know better than anybody else how it feels. Now your sensitivity may not be refined enough to see subtle levels of stress, but there's no way you're going to see the subtle levels of stress until you deal with the blatant ones first. And it's a natural matter that over time, as you get more familiar with the breath, more familiar with the way the body feels from the inside, your powers of sensitivity are going to develop. You pick up things that you didn't see before, both in the breath and in the way the mind relates to the breath. This way you keep the meditation very direct. It's your own private matter. John Fuang once made the point that he didn't want his students discussing their meditation with anybody else. Because when you talk to other people, they, they have their ideas, they have their preconceived notions. Maybe they know something about meditation, but it's, maybe they're very wise. But that in and of itself is a questionable thing. You don't know how experienced they are, how much they really know. And then secondly, you start taking their words, and again, you try to fit them on your own experience. And if you don't have enough inner experience, it's very easy to get messed up. Even when they simply ask you a question, the way they frame the question already has a certain viewpoint inside the question. Then it's a questionable matter whether you want to take on that viewpoint. So keep the meditation a private affair. After all, the suffering you're causing yourself is a private affair, something nobody else can see. Even when we live together day in and day out, there's a lot of decisions that each of us are making that nobody else here will know. We may see some of the outside effects. But the actual experience of suffering, your suffering, your pain, you're the only person who can feel it. And you're the only person who can know which little decisions you make from moment to moment to moment. And that's what you want to learn. So 
So you want to develop your inner sensitivity as much as you can. So we make sure that you direct it in the right direction. The, the intentional element here is to try to minimize suffering as much as possible. This is why breath meditation relates directly to those sublime attitudes that we chant every evening. Front row seat and the question of how to bring about more happiness. You may all living beings be happy. Well, all living beings are out there, but you're one of them too in here. And this is the one that you have the most direct impact on. So if you learn how to be kind to yourself in the way you breathe, it's going to be easier to be kind to other people. If you see that there's some stress or suffering inside, well, have some compassion for yourself. Try to breathe in a way, try to relate to the breath in a way that minimizes that stress. And we, when you learn compassion for yourself inside like this, it's a lot easier to feel compassion for others outside. The same with empathetic joy and equanimity. The things in the breath that you can't change that you just got to watch for a while. The word equanimity actually relates to that, just watching, looking on. In other words, seeing there may not yet be the time to do anything, but you never know when the situation will change. So you just keep watching, 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 until you detect things. And even here the breath helps a lot, gives you a foundation from which to watch. As you're staying with the breath, you're in the present moment. And being with the sensation of the breathing helps pull you outside a lot of your thoughts, that ongoing committee discussion in the mind. If you're with the breath, you're like an outside observer. You're not pushed, necessarily pushed along by the voices in the committee. And that way you're in a better position to see, is this the time to exercise goodwill or is it more the time to exercise equanimity, compassion? or empathetic joy. So the two types of meditation, the meditation that develops the sublime attitudes and the meditation of the breath. Really come together like this. This breath gives you practice in the proper attitudes and it puts you in a position where you can see which of the which of these four attitudes is appropriate at any one time. always taking your inner experience of stress, something that you are most intimately related to, as your touchstone, so that it's not just words, but there's a direct experience that underlies it all. The skill being developed and being more sensitive to what that experience is, and being very honest with yourself. about where you're still causing yourself stress. Because this ultimately is what is your own and only, and only proof that it's working, if you're honest with yourself. Often there's a question, who out there is awakened, who's not awakened? Well, you may have some ideas, you may have some intuitions. But you can't really prove anything about what's going on outside. Your only real proof is what lies inside. And until you make the inner proof as clear and as honest as possible, you'll have no proof at all about anything. So it's this inner sensitivity, something that's totally private to you. That's what you're trying to develop here. That's where you start. And that's what helps keep you on the path. And of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be here only while you're sitting and meditating. Try to keep in touch with your inner experience of what you're doing and what stress is or is not arising as a result of what you're doing inside, the little choices you make inside. Try to carry that around as much as you can in all your activities. Make that first priority. 
When you act, act from that point. When you speak, speak from that point. When you think, think from that point. In that way the meditation becomes timeless. And John Fuang once made the comment that our lives are often chopped up into little times. Time to eat, time to talk, time to go here, go there, do this, do that. And instead of being more, when it has more times like this, everything gets chopped up into little tiny pieces. It becomes less. But when you make this inner sensitivity as continuous as possible, you breathe in. Let the body breathe out if it wants to, but you don't have to force the breath out. Breathe in again, breathe in again. And that inner sense of well-being can grow. Then as you carry it through the day, it becomes something really solid. It takes time to focus on it, time to get a sense of what helps it and what doesn't help it. But the sense of inner refreshment that comes, you want that to be as continuous as possible. The more continuous it is, the more strength it develops, the more resilient it becomes, the more you can rely on it, even in very difficult situations. This involves unlearning some old habits. Often we're taught to give all our attention to things outside. And what happens, of course, is that we lose touch with our own inner sensitivity. We become strangers to ourselves. So reintroduce yourself to this inner sensitivity. Open up this area of your awareness and be as sensitive as possible to it. And that way the meditation will grow in an organic way. Not from words imposed outside or ideas imposed from how you understand the words outside. But a direct experience of what's actually going on inside. What works and what doesn't work. What's skillful, what's not. Where there's stress, where there's no stress. These are the questions that only you can observe and only you can know. And they can only be answered by a very honest sensitivity that's always willing to learn more.